Hello class and welcome to chapter 8, Lifting and Moving Patients of the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, 12th edition. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will understand the body mechanics of patient movement, principles of safe reaching and pulling, urgent and non-urgent moves, how to move patients as a team, types of patient packaging and moving equipment, how to protect yourself from injury when moving patients, and the use of medical restraints. Okay, so let's get started. In the course of a call, you will have to move patients several times to provide emergency medical care and transport. So at a minimum, you will have to lift and carry the patient to the stretcher, move the stretcher to the ambulance, and load the stretcher into the patient compartment. To move patients without injury, to the patient yourself or your team, you need to learn how to lift and carry a patient properly. Knowledge of proper body mechanics and a power grip is important. Okay, so let's talk about the wheeled ambulance stretcher. It's also called the stretcher or gurney and the device most commonly used to move and transport patients generally not taken up or down stairs or to other locations where the patient must be carried for any significant distance. Moving a patient by rolling using a stretcher or a wheeled device is preferred when the situation allows and helps prevent injuries from carrying. So some of the general features of the stretchers, they have a um, specific head and and specific foot end and they're strong rectangular they're tubular metal main frame to which all other parts are attached their retractable guardrails are attached along the center portion of the main frame to prevent the patient from rolling off the stretcher the undercarriage frame allows the litter to be adjusted to any height and locked into place the stretcher remains locked at its present height when the controls are not activated. So hinges at the center allow the head end to be elevated and the patient's back to be positioned at any desired angle. The undercarriage is designed so that the litter can be adjusted to any height, like I said, and the mattress is fluid resistant so that it does not absorb potentially infectious materials and allows for easy cleaning and disinfecting and the patient is secured with straps, and the straps protect the patient from further injury. All right, so once we um, move from backboards we're, or stretchers, we're gonna talk about backboards next. And backboards are long flat boards made of rigid rectangular material. They're used to carry and immobilize supine patients with suspected hip, pelvic, spinal, and lower extremity injuries or other multi, multiple trauma. They can also be used to move patients out of awkward places. Parallel to the sides and ends of the board are long holes that serve as handles and that allow straps to be used to secure the patient to the board. Moving and positioning the patient. So we're gonna talk about that next. And when you move the patient, take care that injury does not occur to you, your team, or your patient. So. Patient lifting and moving are technical skills that require repetitive training and practice. So using bo proper body mechanics and maintaining physical fitness greatly reduce the chance of injuries. Moving a patient should be done in an orderly, planned, and unhurried manner. You must master the skills necessary for the use of equipment and understand the advantages and limitations of each device before you use it in the field. So let's talk about some body mechanics next. And just a quick anatomy review. So when you're standing upright, the vertebrae are stacked on top of each other and aligned over the sacrum. So the sacrum is both the mechanical weight-bearing base of the spinal column and the fused central posterior section of the pelvic girdle. So when you talk about body mechanics, that's the relationship between the body's autotomic structures and the physical forces associated with lifting, moving, and carrying. So very little strain occurs when the spinal column remains in alignment. 
Okay, so the lifting position, you should have the shoulder girdle should be aligned over your pelvis. Your hands should be held close to the legs. When this is happening, force then goes essentially straight down your spinal cord and very little strain occurs. And this figure shows that the correct way to lift. Okay, you um, may injure your back if you lift while leaning forward or if you lift while your back is straight but you're bent forward at the hips. So, lifting techniques. So, your legs should be spread about 15 inches apart or shoulder width. You place um, your feet so that they, that your center of your gravity is properly balanced. Weight should be balanced on the balls of your feet, not your toes with your back held upright, bring your upper body down by bending at the legs, grasp the patient or stretcher and make any necessary adjustments in the location of your feet. We're gonna lift the patient by raising our upper body and arms and straightening our legs until we are in the standing position and then curling our arms up to waist height. Lifting by extending the properly place flex legs is the safest and most powerful way to lift. This is called the power lift. Do not lift a patient or heavy object with your arms outstretched. Avoid placing lateral force across the spine and sideways leverage against the low back. Keep your arms at a safe distance apart when, when hanging your arms at the side of your body. Use the power grip to get maximum force from hands when you're lifting. And so what the power grip is, is the palms are up and the thumbs extend upward. So hands are about 10 inches apart. All fingers are at the same angle. Fingers and thumb are curled tightly over the top of the handle and fully support the handle with your curved palm. And that figure um, on the slide, it shows a great photo of the power grip. When directly lifting the patient, tightly grip the patient in the place and manner that will ensure that you will not lose your grip on the patient. All right, so let's talk about some safe uh, reaching and pulling principles. So the same body mechanics and practices and principles apply to moving, lifting, and carrying a patient. So let's talk about the body drag. And when you do this, you're going to keep your back locked in a slight curve created by tightening your abdominal muscles, not curved or bent laterally. Kneel and extend your arms no more than 15 to 20 inches in front of you. When you can pull no further because your hands have reached the front of your torso, stop, move back another 15 to 20 inches. So alternate between pulling the patient by slowly flexing your arms and repositioning yourself. This figure shows how to perform a body drag. If you must drag a patient across the bed, kneel on the bed to avoid reaching beyond the recommended distance. Drag the patient to within about 15 to 20 inches. Complete the drag while standing at the side of the bed. Use a sheet or blanket under the patient rather than dragging the patient by his or her clothing. In the hospital, when you're transferring the patient from the stretcher to the bed um, by a body drag, the stretcher should be the same height or slightly higher than the bed. You and your partner should kneel on the bed and drag in increments. Then there is the log roll. So you can um, log rolling a patient onto his or her side uh, to place the patient on the backboard. You're gonna kneel as close to the patient's side as possible. And when you lean forward, keep your back straight and lean solely from the hips. Roll the patient without stopping until the patient is resting on his or her side and braced against your thighs. Pulling towards you allows your legs to prevent the patient from rolling over completely and from rolling beyond the intended distance. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about safe lifting and carrying. So whenever possible, use a device that can be rolled to move the patient. When a wheeled device is not available, make sure that you can understand and follow the proper guidelines for carrying a patient to the stretcher. So 
a patient's weight. So you need to estimate the patient's weight before lifting. Adults often weigh between 120 to 220 pounds. So two EMTs should be able to safely lift this weight. Use for providers to lift though when possible. Do not attempt to lift a patient who weighs more than 250 pounds with fewer than four providers. Know the weight limitations of the equipment and how to handle the patient who exceeds the weight limitations. Special bariatric techniques, equipment, and resources are generally required to move patients weighing more than 350 pounds. Lifting and carrying a patient on the backboard or stretcher. So more of the patient's weight rests at the head of the stretcher than um, half of the device than on the foot half. The diamond carriers use, um, uses one EMT at the head and one EMT at the foot of the backboard and one on each side of the torso. And then the one-handed carry includes four or more rescuers, each using one hand to support the backboard so that they are able to face forward as they're walking. And these can be found in the skill drills in chapter eight. All right, and then there's also a, a figure. So the, this figure shows the diamond carry for the stretcher. When the stretcher must be carried, it is best if four providers are available to carry it. One provider should be positioned at each corner of the stretcher to provide an even lift. And when you're rolling the wheeled ambulance stretcher, make sure it is in the fully elevated position. Next, we're gonna talk about the stair chair. So moving a patient with a stair chair. Use a stair chair to carry a patient up or down the flight of stairs or other significant incline. If the patient is conscious, and the patient's condition allows for him or her to be placed in a seated position. So a stair chair is a lightweight folding chair with a molded seat, adjustable safety straps, and fold-out handles at both the head and the feet. Most models have rubber wheels on the back with casters in the front so that they can roll along the floor and make turns. You, they're used to bring a conscious patient down to the stretcher. And you can see this in the skill drill in chapter 8-4. Okay. Moving a patient on stairs with a stretcher. So a backboard should be used for a patient who is unresponsive or must be moved in a supine position. So um, also a patient who must be immobilized needs to be on the backboard. So carry the patient on the backboard down the stairs to the prepared stretcher. Place the strongest EMTs at the head and foot ends of the board. The taller person should be at the foot end, of course. And once you reach the stretcher, place um, both of the backboard and the patient on the stretcher. Secure both the stretcher with additional straps. To carry a patient on the stairs on a backboard, follow the skill drills in um, 8-5. Okay. Loading a wheeled stretcher into the ambulance, so ensure the frame is held firmly between two hands so it does not tip. Newer models are self-loading, so extra wheels at the end of the stretcher allow you to push the stretcher into the back of the ambulance. Models that are not self-loading need to be lowered and then lifted to the height of the floor of the ambulance. Clamps inside the ambulance will hold the stretcher in place during transport. And then there's a skill drill. It's 8-6. Okay, so directions and commands. So team actions must be coordinated. And we talk about having a team leader. And this team leader indicates where each team member should be and rapidly describes the sequence of steps to perform before lifting. They are preparatory commands and countdowns that they will use. And um, so, for example, um, stop or all ready to stop, you know, countdowns are used. Okay, and then carefully plan ahead. So select the methods that you will involve the least amount of lifting and carrying. Consider whether there is an option that will cause um, some type of strain. So emergency moves, okay? So what are emergency moves? And emergency moves are used when there is a potential for danger before assessment can, and care can be provided. So use emergency moves 
when you cannot properly assess the patient or provide immediate care because of the patient's position. So techniques to prevent ag aggregation of the patient's spinal cord injury, if there is one present, we use a clothes drag. In this, we could pull on the patient's clothing in the neck and shoulder area. We could use a blanket drag. And this is, uh, we place the patient on a blanket coat or other item that can be pulled. We could use an arm drag. Rotate the patient's arms so that they are extended on the ground above his head and grasp the wrist and drag the patient. Or you could do the arm to arm drag. And basically you're placing the arms under the patient's shoulders and through the armpits and what you're while you're grasping the opposite wrist and you're dragging the patient backwards. And this, these figures show the different types of drag. So you have the closed drag, the blanket drag, the arm drag, and then the armpit drag. Removing an unconscious patient from a vehicle alone, you need to move the patient's legs clear of the pedals. Rotate the patient so that his or her feet um, or back are towards an open door. Then place the arms under the patient's shoulders and through the patient's armpits and support the patient's head against your body. If the legs and feet clear the car, rapidly drag the patient from the seat to a safe location. And this figure shows the steps to remove an unconscious patient from the vehicle. So urgent moves. An urgent move may be necessary when we have a patient with an altered, um, loss of, uh, altered level of consciousness or with inadequate ventilation, in shock, or in extreme weather conditions. Also, a rapid extrication technique should be used when the patient is sitting in a vehicle and must be urgently moved. Whether a backboard is used for the skill will depend on your local protocols. This technique should only be used if urgency exists. So these special circumstances could be if the vehicle or scene is unsafe, if explosives or other hazards are on scene, maybe the car is on fire or is um, there's a danger of that, or the patient could not be properly assessed prior to the removal of the vehicle. The patient needs immediate intervention that requires the supine position, or if the patient has a life-threatening condition requiring immediate transport, or the patient blocks your access to other serious injured patients. So using the rapid extrication technique, a patient can be moved from the sitting position in the vehicle to a supine on the backboard in one minute or less. Okay, so because of its rapid nature, this technique increases the risk of damage if the patient has a spinal cord injury. So look at all available options before using this technique. Once the patient has been moved onto the backboard, move the patient away from the hazard to begin life-saving treatment. All right, so some non-urgent moves, and we can use these um, when both the scene and the patient are stable, and we're going to carefully plan how to move the patient. So methods for lifting and carrying, we could use the direct ground lift, and this is used for patients with no suspected spinal cord who are found on the ground. We use the direct ground lift when the patient will need to be carried a distance to the stretcher. So EMT stand side by side to lift the patient um, and, and carry the patient. Then there's the extremity lift, and this is used for patients with no suspected or extremity or spinal cord injury. They may be helpful when the patient is in a small space because it does not require EMTs to stand side by side. One EMT is positioned at the head and the other is positioned at the feet. And you're going to coordinate the movements by using direct verbal commands. Okay. Then there's transfer moves. Transfer moves include direct carry, draw sheet method, or using a scoop stretcher or other carries. Okay. So direct carry is with two or more rescuers. We're going to move supine patient from the bed to the stretcher. We're using a direct carry. Okay. A draw sheet method, we're using two or more rescuers. We're moving the patient from the bed to the stretcher using a sheet or blanket. Using a scoop stretcher, we're going to insert the halves of the scoop stretcher under the patient, and we're going to fasten the sides. Other carries are the log roll or slide to move the patient to the backboard. Okay. Okay. When it comes to geriatrics, 
most patients transported by EMS are geriatric patients, and there are some skeletal changes, okay? So we need to be careful of those. Uh, changes in older people may cause brittle bones, rigidity, or spinal curvatures, and these patients cannot lie supine on the backboard or scoop stretcher without ha causing further injuries. So consider using geriatric specific mobilization devices such as vacuum mattresses. And this figure is going to show the skeletal changes. So this is kyphosis. All right, and then bariatrics. So the management of or prevention of obesity or um, diseases and bariatrics, okay? Bariatric patients are taking an increasing toll on the health of EMTs. Back injuries account for the largest number of missed days with EMTs. So stretchers and equipment are being produced with over higher cap with ever higher capacity. So increased capacity does not address the danger of users of that equipment. So mechanical ambulance lifts are used in Europe but are uncommon in the United States. So some additional um, the devices. So this is a on the figure you could see the bariatric stretcher. It's a specialized wheeled stretcher for overweight or obese patients. Um, they have a higher or wider patient surface area and a wider wheelbase, allowing for increased stability. The most important feature is an increased weight lifting capacity. And then the mnemonic or electric powered wheel stretchers. So these are battery or air operated with electric controls to raise and lower the undercarriage. Devices limit the risk of injury to the providers and to the patients. Okay. Then there's portable or folding stretchers. So these stretchers with long um, rectangular um, tubular frame with rigid fabric stretched across it. So they're used in areas where it's difficult to read. They weigh much less than wheeled stretchers. All right, and then you have flexible stretchers and these can be rolled up across the stretchers width or length so that the stretcher becomes a smaller tubular package and it conforms around the patient's sides and does not extend beyond them. When extended, useful uh, when removing patients from or through a confined space. And then there's short boards, short backboards, and these are used to immobilize the head, torso, and neck of a seated patient with a suspected spinal cord injury until the patient can be moved to a long backboard. Short wooden backboards have mostly been replaced with this vest style type device that you see in the photo. It's a KED, and what that stands for is Kendrick Extrication Device. Um, and you could see a photo of that on the slide. Then you have the vacuum mattresses. This is an alternative to a backboard for immobilizing geriatric and pediatric patients. The patient is placed on the mattress and the air is removed from the device, allowing it to mold to the patient. It provides a high degree of immobilization, comfort, and thermal insulation. Then you have basket stretchers. So these are rigid and they're used to carry patients across uneven terrain from a remote location that is inaccessible to an ambulance or another vehicle, okay? So if the patient has suspected spinal injury, secure the patient to a backboard and secure the backboard inside the stretcher. So when you return to the ambulance, if the backboard, um, lift the backboard out of the basket stretcher and place it on the ambulance stretcher. So these are used for technical rope rescues and some types of water rescues. Okay, these are designed to split into two or, two or more pieces. So this is the scoop stretcher. And the pieces are fitted around the patient who's lying on the ground or on some other flat surface. So the parts are then reconnected and the patient is lifted and put onto the backboard. Both sides of the patient must be accessible to use the scoop stretcher and you must fully immobilize and secure the patient onto the scoop stretcher. So it's almost just like putting spatulas underneath them, scooping them up. And then there's a neonatal isolate, and this is for the neonatal patient, so um, uh, birth to 30 days, the first 30 days is that neonatal period. It cannot be transported on the wheeled stretcher. It keeps the neonatal 
um, patient warm with moistened air in a clean environment. It protects from noise, drafts, infection, and excessive handling. This isolate um, can be placed directly on the wheeled stretcher and secured with seat belts, and uh, it's freestanding and secured onto the back of the ambulance in place or of where the stretcher could be. Then there's decon. So it's essential that you decontaminate the equipment after we use it. And that's for our safety and the safety of the crew and then the safety of the patients, of course, and then preventing the spread of disease. So know and follow your local standard operating procedures for disinfecting the equipment. Let's talk about patient positioning. Okay, so the patients must be properly positioned based on their chief complaint. So when we talk about this, if we have a patient who has no suspected injury, um, reporting of chest pain or respiratory distress, we should place the patient uh, in the position of comfort, and that's typically the Fowler or semi-Fowler position. So patients who are in shock should be packaged and placed in the supine position. Patients in late stages of pregnancy, they should be positioned and transported on their left side if, if they are uncomfortable or the hypotensive supine um, exists. Okay. So an unresponsive patient with no suspected injury, um, hip or pelvic injury should be placed in the recovery position. And a patient who is nauseated or vomited, vomiting should be transported in the position of comfort. Now let's talk about medical restraints. So first evaluate as a patient um, for correctable causes of combativeness, such as a head injury or hypoxia or hypoglycemia, and follow your local protocols or obtain medical authorization if necessary. You're going to require, um, restraints re uh, require a minimum of five people. So one for each extremity and one for the head. One EMT should be uh, the established team leader. The patient should be in the supine position and the patient in a prone position can develop um, some type of asphyxia. So we want to keep them in the supine position. Each extremity should have a restraint applied to it. The patient should be restrained to the backboard with one arm above his or her head and the other arm down by his side. Assess the ABC's mental status and circulation um, after, during, and um, often. Okay, and then document all that information. Personal consideration. So ask yourself these questions before moving the patient. Am I physically strong enough? Is there adequate room for me to get um, the proper stance to lift the patient? And do I need personal um, for lifting assistance? Do I need additional personnel? So injured EMTs cannot help anymore. All right, so that concludes chapter eight, lifting and moving patients. Let's just go through the review questions, see what how much we've learned. So what is the first rule of lifting? What do we know? Are we going to use our arms to do most of the lifting? No, we're going to always keep our back in the straight upright position. It's the best use. Okay, when lifting a stretcher using a power lift, you should, what should we do? We should have our hands should be facing palms up. This is a better power lift and it is not as stressful on the wrist. Okay, so C, place your hands, palms up on the leader handle. It is important to apply a vest type extrication device on a critically injured patient to remove him or her from a wreck because it, oh, it is impractical. Yes, because it takes too long. <laughs> a, it takes too long. Proper guidelines for correct reaching include all of the following except, all right, which one does not include? Reaching no more than 30 inches in front of your body. All right. That's right. We don't want to reach no more than 30 inches in front of our body. Okay. An injured hand glider is trapped at the top of a large mountain and must be evacuated to the ground. The terrain is very rough and uneven. Which of the following devices would be the safest and most appropriate? Hmm. I think it would probably be the Stokes basket. 
All right. And what the Stokes basket is, it's a basket stretcher. So I think that we went over it in um, it being called a basket stretcher. Okay. When two EMTs are lifting a patient on a long backboard, they should. They should, since there is more than half of the patient's weight is distributed to the head end of the backboard or stretcher, you should always ensure that the strongest EMT is in that position. Okay? So position the strongest EMT at the head of the board. Which of the following techniques is considered to be an emergency move? The firefighter's drag is a one-person technique that's used when the patient must be removed from a life-threatening situation, so that would be the firefighter's drag. To extricate a patient from the basement of a building, you must transport the patient up a flight of stairs. In doing this, you must ensure that we don't want the feet to go first. We know that. So we know that if we're going on an up on an incline, we want to ensure that the head, the head goes first, not the feet. Hmm. If an injured patient must be moved but is not in immediate danger from a fire or building collapse, you should first Of course, the only time your attention should be directed away from the primary assessment is if there's a life immediate danger, life threat. So the first thing we should do is check the airway, breathing, and circulation. The rapid extrication technique is to the rapid extrication technique is to remove a person rapidly from a vehicle to a supine position onto a backboard. So that was D. All right. And thank you for joining us, uh, chapter eight, uh, lifting and moving patients.